from a solar-powered shed in Rockland County, New York, the United Kingdom's next Prime Minister, Pete Dominic. That's right, folks, I've been asked. I've been called upon to serve, and serve I will. I kid the crown. I'm just hanging out in the shed, and I am very happy to have you joining me on today's uh, special podcast, because I say special because it's the guest, Ali Belshi. That's who's on with me today. There's nothing other special than that. No fanfare, no preamble, no other guest, because it's the Friday show. Couldn't get it together to get Christian and Ophira on, but we will circle back for next week. And ooh, next week is already looking good, folks. And couldn't do much more because I hosted The Hangout on Thursday night where we had an amazing time. Over 40 people there together and laughing and arguing and having a great old time talking about politics, journalism, life, and and trying to understand as one of our friends. I won't call her out because I don't want to get her in trouble uh, at work, but we were trying to understand why anybody would pee loudly while they were on the phone with a work call or anybody else. So we spent some time on that as well. Always fun. We had a great time and we'd love for you to be there. So if you're not already a paid subscriber, sign up now and join us on Thursday nights and anytime on the Discord platform. Go to standupwithpete.com or patreon.com slash Pete Dominic. Okay. Well, I've known our guest on today's show since 2010 when I met him, when I was working at CNN. He was always so good to me then. We were got pretty close then, and I joined him on his show, Your Money, quite often that he used to co-host with Christine Romans, who he also actually co-authored a book with. So we go way back, Ellie Belshi and I. He's a Canadian-American. He was the uh, senior economic and business correspondent for NBC since 2016. Before that, he was at Al Jazeera. Before that, he was at CNN for years. And now he's one of the most respected names on TV journalism. I mean, unfortunately, he's still going out there and standing in hurricanes, which I berated him for. But we had an awesome conversation, as we always do. He's very kind to give me an hour of his time. You should watch his show. It's the best show on cable news. It's called Velshi. He does deep dives every week. He's got the band book club. So many fans amongst us here on Stand Up, Saturday, Sunday, 8 to 10 a.m. And, of course, he's on Twitter at Ali Velshi, where he's got a massive following. Oh, my God, almost 700,000 followers. Couldn't be a better guy. Couldn't be a better friend. And I don't think we could have had a better conversation. So let's get to it, shall we? Ladies and gentlemen, it's Ali Velshi on Stand Up right now. Yes, Ali Velshi sitting in front of a painting that would that is all about you. It's it's you had it commissioned. I love that. That's beautiful. It's a typewriter, and on one side there's Philly, and the other side New York, and it's a roomy quote. And and what does that say about who you are? These are the places that you live, and this is the work that you do. Well, I'm, I'm fascinated by old typewriters. Um, oh. I'm old enough that there were typewriters when I was a kid, and so um, I've always loved these old typewriters. And I I bought this typewriter once. Uh, I have it. Uh, it's a it's a it's an old uh, number five uh, Underwood standard, you know, typical typewriter that journalists would have used in the day. And I I found an artist who only p- paints typewriters. And so he's painted this typewriter and he wanted me to put a quote in it. So I put a roomy quote uh, where it says out there beyond the ideas of right doing and wrong doing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. And that's sort of, you know, that's kind of my philosophy, right, in 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 talking to people that. A lot of people I don't agree with, and I, I don't need to agree with their views, but I do believe in validating people, right? I, I want to know why they have their views. I want to understand why they have their views. That's a tough thing to do in my job these days, but I, you know, this is many, many years old, and this is a commitment I had many, many years ago to pursuing journalism that way, that there are bad faith actors, and they're not yeah. people I want to book on my shows, but there are a lot of good faith actors who don't share views that I have, whether they be about abortion or minimum wage or or you know, all sorts of major issues that we face. And I, I need my view is that people like you and me have to engage those people all the time. If you're a casual viewer or reader or listener, totally fine for you to say, I'm done with that. I'm not listening to these people's garbage. I don't want to do that. But that's not a choice we have. Right. We're we are the equivalent of uh, firefighters. You can't not go to the fire because you're done with fires. Right. We we have to go into the conversation. So this this painting in my living room reminds me of what it is I do and why I do it. And by the way, you know, I split my time between New York and Philly. So in the background of the painting, half of it is a New York skyline and half of it is a Philly skyline. I love it. I love you. I appreciate you uh, lumping me in with you a little bit there. But 
you are doing uh, a great kind of work in journalism. And I want to ask you about some of those those views. Like we've been talking you and I for years, mainly yeah. about issues, issues like deep dive issues. At times we've disagreed on things and I can't even remember what they are now. But, you know, talking about energy and capitalism or what I don't know what, what we ever talked about. But like you talk about hearing other people's views. But what if my view was and I'm not joking, I'm being serious here because, you know, it's a, a QAnon belief and you get have. Great reporters over at NBC News covering this, so, so you're covering this. But what if my view was, that, you know, that uh, JFK Jr. is alive and he's gonna, he's gonna, he's coming back, and I'm dead serious. Like, how do yeah. you, what do you do about that? So I think there are three filters that I use when when <laughs> talking to people. One is, are you operating in good faith, regardless of how crazy your belief is? You you may think JFK coming back, but are you a disinformation purveyor, or do you actually have you been led to believe it? Right. If I can determine that you have been led to believe it, the conversation may continue. Then the conversation moves into the facts of the matter. Where are you getting your facts from? And do you feel that that's appropriate? Do you feel that that's a broad enough uh, set of sources where you can get your facts? Does it surprise you, for instance, that um, nobody else in mainstream media shares that particular view? Uh, Is it all from Facebook? Is it all from 4chan or places like that? Um, and that can be the conversation ender once somebody realizes that, oh, you all in mainstream media are all part of the ch- children eating cabal, then, you know, that's that does sort of end the conversation at that point. <laughs> if we can get back past the fact that you're good faith, meaning you really believe it, you're not trying to spread uh, disinformation for money like Alex Jones was. And B, your sources of information are poor. Um, You've you got bad quality of information and you've got some failures in your critical thinking. I can still go to the third point. Then the third point becomes a discussion about validating you and why you think that. Only after you get to those, when I say validating, it's like, okay, tell me why you think that that's actually the case and tell me what that makes you feel like. And, you know, like psychology stuff. Once you can get past those three points, you may be able to have a discussion in which you can enter into a debate. You can convince someone that your good faith view is that JFK died on this particular date in this particular place. And here's what you base it on. And then you can start to have that conversation. The bottom line is, whatever you think it is, 30 percent, 40 percent of the population who holds unusual, um, unsubstantiated views in this country, they still have as much of a vote as you do. So you can't just decide they're not there. You can't just decide you're not engaging. You can't just decide that you're not going to listen to the news that covers what they do, because that when you do that, you you fall victim to the idea that there's a movement out there that you didn't know about. And all of a sudden, your side lost in the election and you're in entirely puzzled as to why, because you haven't gotten out of your own bubble. So to me, this is an exercise in getting out of my own bubble. I don't like it. I like my bubble better. My bubble <laughs> makes sense. My bubble's not made up of BS. It's it's made up of right. factual stuff. Right. But I live in a society in which some people's bubbles are made up of BS, and I have to do what I can to try and, and get into that a little bit. You, yeah, yeah. And you do a great job of it. I mean, what, what mentioned Alex Jones, and you work at MSNBC, you sat in for and held that nine o'clock seat, uh, but you sat in for Rachel Maddow. You know Rachel really well, I'm, I'm guessing. J.D. Yep. Vance said that Alex Jones is more credible than Rachel Maddow. You'd be a good person to ask just about that quote, not in terms of taking it personally or anything even about Rachel, but in terms of the, where, where we're at with the Overton window. If the guy who may be the next senator, certainly is the nominee, is saying that about Alex Jones, who you and I used to be able to pretty comfortably ignore, but now obviously have to talk about. Yeah, I, I don't know if J.D. Vance is in a position to be talking about people's credibility to start with, but OK. Um, <laughs> the issue is, and I always say this with with people, most people I meet love Rachel. They think she's the best thing in the world. Um, we all have our detractors. And when when somebody says to me, well, why isn't isn't Rachel Maddow basically just Sean Hannity of the left? I said, no, Ra- Rachel Maddow works for NBC News. We have a standards department uh, and a legal department. And you can't actually you can have an opinion. Rachel and I are both uh, prospective hosts. We are there to have an opinion, but the opinion can't lie. It can't be about untrue things. We can't call children who died at Sandy Hook. I was at Sandy Hook. I covered the entire story, Uh, right? There there wasn't enough time to get crisis actors into place. So (laughs) we can't lie about things that, that actually happened. We can have an opinion about what happened. Alex Jones was just lying. Marjorie Taylor Greene just lies about stuff. Herschel Walker just lies about stuff. Uh, that that's what the distinction is. People say to me, you know, the news is really broken and we need objectivity back. No, we don't. Objectivity was never the problem. 
Reliability is the problem. Honesty is the problem. Lying is the problem. The, the pervasive spread, deliberate spread of disinformation is the problem. Rachel has opinions. She backs them up with facts. You can research them. They have fact checkers on every single segment. There's a lawyer on their actual staff. They, they check all their information. I never want opinion to go away. We all have opinions. That's the distinction. So Alex Jones is just not more credible than Rachel Maddow. They're not even in the same scale of credibility. And, and you know, J.D. Vance is a guy I once respected. I, I, I read his stuff. I thought, what an interesting guy. What a self-aware person. What a great lesson that I learned from him. I learned things from him about growing up poor in America that, that I have never understood. I didn't grow up in America and I didn't grow up poor. And then this. I, I don't know what's happened to people, but I understand the temptation to entirely disengage from these people, except J.D. Vance, as you said, may be yeah. uh, a senator to the United States. So my view is we as journalists or we as people who engage people for a living cannot make that choice. You know, I mean, I I'm have been in a battle. We won the Board of Education here, but we were in a real battle against the anti-CRT people yeah. here who want to ban a lot of books. You've done this segment on your show for we- my favorite segment every week. I, I have the band book club, the band book club. And so what about those folks? Now they're not, I mean, I'm sure there's overlap with QAnon and a lot of conspiracy theory, but these are folks who I, I'll, I'll generalize here and say they are taking excerpts out of a book. Then they are lying about it being taught. Cause usually the case is the book just exists in the school library. Sometimes yeah. it's being taught, but then they, you know, they want their kids to be able to opt out. They, and, and they take, Oh, going a lot further than that, which you can pick up there. But just on that issue, how do we deal with people who want to ban books, Ali you, don't, you attend the school board meetings. Yes. You attend yes. your PTA meetings. You um, you run for school board. Do you, yeah. know how many, you know how many school board nominees there are running in November unopposed? Why is anybody running unopposed? This is, a, this is a democracy. This is not Iran. This is not Russia. You don't have to be cleared to run as a candidate. So number one, you have to be involved. If, if your civic involvement goes no further than the absolute localist level, your school board, your community board, as we have in New York, your um, your local city council, and you should be a candidate or, or you should go out and support someone. That's number one. Number two, I think most people who look to ban books don't read the books. People who read books don't tend to ban books. They tend to give you critical views of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, with the ban book club, it's not that every book I ban is universally supported by my audience. There are people who really don't like some of these books. I had Huckleberry Finn on. I had a whole lot of uh, black people write to me saying, you know how many times the N-word is used in there? Mm. Um, it's offensive. I don't want my kid exposed to the N-word on that regular basis. Mm. And then I had you know, people making the argument that, look, kids are smarter than you think they are. They can handle more than you can think they do. A lot of the books that are banned today are young, queer, people of color, yeah. talking about sexual assault or... Um, uh, views of the history of this country that they didn't know, but what they call CRT incorrectly. It's a lot of prudishness. But that would be to ignore the fact, Pete, that most of these efforts to get banned the books either banned, taken off curriculums, taken out of school libraries, not taught to kids, are backed by a very well-funded and organized uh, infrastructure of conservative movements. Uh, who are trying to do this. It is a, it is not a whim. It's not some, there are definitely, again, it's a good faith argument. There are good faith arguments who say, I don't really want my kid learning about transgender six-year-olds yeah. because I don't think they're ready for that. And I don't think they understand it. And there's a valid argument to be had about whether they should or shouldn't. And I have that discussion every week, but that's not what most of this is, Pete. Most of this is fear mongering by uh, conservative groups, the sort of which have been around in this country for yeah hundreds of years and around in every country, by the way, it was it was what they did in Germany uh, before the Holocaust. So you must really, really be very cautious about people who want to ban books and why they want to ban it. And you must force them to fill out big uh, like applications and pieces of paper to demonstrate that they've actually read the book um, and then make the case. That's a good idea, actually. I, didn't even, I haven't seen that, that be done, but take take notes, folks. You know, I actually haven't seen I, I, I've heard what you said, uh, that claim a lot that these organ they're kind of uh, organized funded movements by white right wing interests or, or, or but like in my town, I don't think that was the case. And they were really powerful here. I think 
they, it's it's pretty grassroots. I think they start up in their Facebook groups. I, I mean, I kind of saw it happen here. Someone just starts posting. They're teaching this. They're teaching that. And the whole group of them, I mean, it started with uh, COVID and, and, and masks. And then they built, they kind of organized. I feel like it was very grassroots, but they were still, you know, uh, taking their their tips and notes from kind of national right wing media and so on. Yeah. I, I, I'd the, like the line is blurred, right, between what's actually organized by groups, yeah, uh, and and possibly funded, by the way, and what is uh, material that goes out there into uh, places that are ripe to receive that material, like Facebook groups and things like that, which give you the talking points, yeah. give you the book titles that you want that you should ban. I mean, I look at a place like York County, Pennsylvania, which is a perfect example, right? There was a, the teachers in York County or somebody in York County came up with what was called a resource list. This was post George Floyd. They were saying, you know what? We don't, we don't teach enough about things across the board. We don't have enough Latino uh, uh, writers. We don't have enough about sexual assault. We don't have enough about racism. So they created what was called a resource list. There was just a list to inform teachers to say, if you wanted to spread your wings a little bit and, and, and delve into some of these more political issues, here's a bunch of books that you can use. They banned the entire list. <sighs> so I, I was one of Brad Meltzer's book. You know, the little I am series. I am Rosa Parks. I am Mahatma Gandhi or whatever. No, they but go banned, ahead. They're fantastic books for little kids. Oh, yeah, they I do know those. Out. I got those for my daughters. Yes, of course yeah. I do. They're for, yes, go ahead. But they banned one of those. There's a series of books called Girls Who Code by the organization Girls Who Code. It's right. four books about girls who do this after school coding thing. They banned those. What are you, what are you talking about booking, banning books on Girls Who Code? What are you banning I Am Rosa Parks for? Where is Rosa Parks controversial in America? But because they appeared on the list, they got banned. Some people ban authors because they're queer, because they're gay, because there's sexual material in the books. But when you're writing a book about a sexual assault of a, of a, a, a gay, queer, a uh, 14-year-old, which happens, by the way, in of school of or does. sexual assault by somebody of the other gender, it happens. And if a kid doesn't have the access to a, a nuanced and contextual discussion around that happens, wh- how that happens, maybe they just don't talk, right? Lori Hals- Hals Anderson's book, Speak, is about a girl who got raped, who lost her ability to speak. She simply didn't speak about it. And, and that happens to people. So where are you going to tell these people? Where are you going to tell these stories? Because nobody, Pete, wants to have these conversations willingly with their children. It's hard enough to have it with your spouse, as you know, in particular. Right. These are hard conversations. You want to hope you never, ever, ever have a conversation about sexual assault with anyone in your family. But that would just be denialism. That would just be wrong. And it would be a disservice to your family. So why don't you use the help of authors who actually wrote sensible books about these things that can help you yeah. help your kids. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've, I've uh, we've done that. Our, the girls whole lives and we have, there's never a conversation uncomfortable to talk about because it's already been brought up at some point and right. it's just not right. weird. It, and and it, it's so much more comfortable and there's such a better feeling yeah. of, of trust amongst all four of us with each other to talk about anything sexual, sexually, or in, I mean, they're 14 and 17 now and it's like, everything's pretty much out. The only thing that makes, uh, that we can't talk about at all is my wife and I having any sexual relations. The girls hate no. to hear. About, no. I think every child, I don't think any child, what, what child right. feels comfortable talking to his parents? Nobody, nobody wants to talk about yeah, that. Yeah. Um, what are I'm you comfortable talking about it? And I don't, I got nothing to do with it. Exactly. Um, wh- listen, why are you, what are you doing? What are you, you're, you're so respected. You're, um, you're a veteran now in, in the journalism business. Yeah, weird. Cause you and I were just kids. Well, I you know, was kids hanging I around at a bar across the road from CNN. I don't remember you ever being like in any way like young or like when I met you, you were grown ah. up in, in a nice suit. You always I mean, you were always a grown man to me. I, would, I, I never saw you in a more infantile phase. But what I'm trying to say here is why are you standing out? You, I hope you saw my tweets. I'm outraged. I thought of I thought of having an intervention. I thought of like inviting you to Zoom and giving a link out to everybody who loves you and people just start popping up and say, get out of the hurricane, Velshi, get out of there or at least wear gear. You don't. Ha- I know they're not making you do it. I know. I told people no. I told people privately. I go, I guarantee Velshi volunteers for that shit. Wow. And I'm telling you. We have robots. We have younger, more expendable people. Why are you doing this? It's you love it. You have fun doing. It. I know you do. Yeah, there are a few reasons why I do it. Mostly <laughs> it's holding people to account. And and I'll tell you why, because, uh, for instance, on one night that I was out there, um, uh, one uh, city councilor or county commissioner had been on TV talking about 
the uh, degree to which they're going out and they're they're helping people and they're they're getting electrical power back online. They couldn't. The wind hadn't gotten down to the point where they could put those cherry trucks up there, you know, the bucket trucks yeah, that, yeah. that prepare them. So it just it wasn't happening. It was untrue. That was bad information. Somebody was just doing it because they wanted to make their constituents feel good that, you know what, we're on it. We, we know you've lost your power, but we're on it. It's a little lie, but it's it's one that I was able to look outside and take a wind gauge and say, no, you're not. The, the, the liability insurance for the people who go up there doesn't kick in until the wind goes down a certain level. You're not actually repairing anything. There are no I'm I'm here. I'm in the streets. There are no emergency vehicles because the streets are flooded. Let's just not lie to people. If you're out of power, you're going to be out of power for a long time. There was another instance where they said everybody's available can get help. I drove around in Fort Myers Beach and I found a community of shrimpers, shrimp fishermen who are sort of at the low end of the economic scale right. of fishermen. The boats, they've lost their idea. They've lost their money. They were a mile away from being able to get help, but they didn't know how to get there and nobody was there to tell them. So I'm thinking to myself, do we have to do like helicopter drops with leaflets or have uh, high water vehicles go through areas and announce to people one mile over there is where you sign up for FEMA help. We can get you there. But I needed to tell people I need to bear witness to say these people are alone. They don't have a bathroom. They don't have power. They, their phones don't work because the cell towers were all down. Even if their phones work, they have no power uh, to charge their phones. They're being left out. So it's a holding power to account. And you can only hold power to account if you born witness. It's like in Minneapolis, right? When when I got shot by the, 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 the cops there. I was there to bear witness to say that was an absolutely peaceful rally. Yeah. There was nothing actually going on. No one was doing anything. It was just people walking and the cops busted in with with rubber bullets and and tear gas. Right. Until you're there, they want us not to be there because when when we're not there, The Washington Post says democracy dies in darkness. Everything dies in darkness. When our cameras go dark, anybody can say anything they want to anybody. And there's no way for regular people to hold them to account. So it's the one reason I still go out. Remember Katrina, right? Anderson Cooper out in the street with politicians telling him that people aren't dead or aren't dying or whatever, and literally bodies uh, right. floating in the water next to him. That's why we need to go to those. I places. know, but just send somebody else. I've been doing it for a long time. <laughs> kind of my, kind of my gig, <laughs> kind of my jam. Okay, lots of other things I want to get to with you, but first of all, you, just your thoughts on timelines. The midterm elections are just a couple weeks away. What day is it? Um. I guess we're it's, it's, it's a couple of weeks. It's today. It's a Tuesday. It's, yeah. uh, it's going to be two weeks now, two weeks, three yeah. weeks. So three weeks. Well, my question is about the January 6th committee hearings yeah. and, and what happens if Republicans take over the house, which it's anybody's best guess, I guess it's probably going to come right down to the wire and, and a yeah. few districts, uh, maybe probably who knows, yeah, it's, but it's probably going to be but, uh, like, a hundred thousand votes across the country that is going to decide the house, which is which is crazy with all these gerrymandered districts. We can get into all of it, but yep. but what do you think about the the way the committee hearings have gone, the investigation has gone, uh, and what happens if Democrats lose the house with the with these hearings? I mean, it seems like the January six issue day and everything around it seems like such an important investigation. So many resources they yep. put into it. What do you think? Well, I, I mean, I hope that they uh, take all their information and try and pr uh, compile it into a preliminary report. The, the committee expires at the end of the year, and that's when they plan to have their report. And there's so much work because there's, you know, tens of thousands of uh, millions of pages of documents and uh, over a thousand people they've interviewed. So they, it's, it's a hard job to rush. Uh, but um, I, I hope they get it done as fast as they can. I think one of two things will happen. The, the, the best case scenario is if Republicans take control of the House, they just dismantle the committee. But I'm worried that the worst thing will happen. It'll become a revenge committee. They'll keep it in place. They'll uh, reconstitute it. Not with Adam Kinzinger and uh, and Liz Cheney, because they won't be around. Uh, they'll put Jim Jordan and others like that on there. And they will start some kind of investigation into, I don't know, they've said Nancy Pelosi. I don't know what, what you're investigating Nancy Pelosi for. So <clears throat> I think that this is, this, this is the whole good faith, bad faith argument, right? The Republicans in Congress are not a good faith group of people. Um, I don't remember the number, but 140 of them or something voted not to certify the election. There are hundreds of people running for Congress right now as Republicans uh, and governor and secretary of state and attorney general who are election deniers um, in, in Pennsylvania and Arizona. The two gov gubernatorial candidates have said they'll they'd overturn the election if, if they if the election of 2020 happened with Kerry Lake as governor of Arizona and Doug Mastrano as governor of Pennsylvania. Donald Trump would be the president of the United States, notwithstanding 
uh, who um, who got the most votes. There's a case before the Supreme Court right now that's all about something called the independent state legislature theory that says legislatures get to determine who the electors are, not state courts, not state constitutions. This may be the most impactful case before the Supreme Court right now. So I think there's a lot that can go wrong. I'm very, very worried about democracy. And my view is because there's always low voter turnout in these midterms, got to get out there. You've got to, got to, got to vote. And your vote has got to be for democracy, whomever you feel demo- stands for democracy. And there are Republicans in this country, by the way, uh, who you make like. They may be your, your uh, member of Congress. Vote for them if they stand up for democracy. But don't vote for the ones who don't, because this may be your last election with real democracy available to you. The next one, if, if a lot of these deniers get in, that next election, 2024, is not going to be a fair election. You're sure of it. I mean, I mean, that's it. You've interviewed all the experts. I've interviewed many of them. I've watched you interview many of them. I mean, like you seem so sure. I'm very worried about this, Pete. Yeah. I'm an optimist. You know me. I, 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 I like yeah. the world. I, I, I'm happy. I think people are good people. I think people are going to inadvertently give away their democracy. And the examples around the world are that people do that. People fall for these law and order messages. People fall for these their communists and socialist messages. They do it in South America. They did it in Brazil. They, they did it in the Philippines. They're doing it all over the world. They fall for the nonsense about how you need to vote for me because I alone can fix it, as Donald Trump said. Right. We can fix this thing. You're not fixing anything. You're breaking democracy. People in America are going to go to the ballot on November 8th and willingly vote against their self-interests by by voting for Republicans who are election deniers. You know, there's some places like um, Ohio, where the secretary of state candidate Republican, not really an election denier per se, but they play footsie with election deniers. They play footsie with the QAnon people. This is all fine. You know, it's like giving your kid a match. It's all fine until they burn the house down. And that's what's going to happen if enough of these election deniers get into office. And by the way, what, the reason you have to be concerned is because you may not have one running in your district, Pete, but they're going to get elected somewhere else in the country and they're going to be enough of them in Congress right. and they're going to wreck your democracy. Somebody in Kansas and somebody in Georgia and somebody in Texas. So this is why you have to be very active about talking to people on your show as you do and, and in your own life about the fact that you've got to be registered to vote and you've got to vote in this election. Do not let this one get away from you. One of the other things is not only do we need to organize and do everything you possibly can, which, by the way, is fun. It's fun. It's not that much work. It's fun. You meet cool people. But have you done I, I, I either listen. Usually I listen to your show uh, on the podcast uh, over the weekend. But if I've missed this and you probably have talked with some people, one other thing that a lot of people are doing or, or suggesting people do is, is be poll workers. There's some concern about what might actually happen, be happening yep. at the polls. And this kind of as it often does happen, this this conspiracy theory, they say a thing is, is happening that's not. And then uh, they take over the polls and then the elections yep. are actually suspect and not yes. secure the way they said they were about the secure elections. How concerned are you about uh, what what might hijinks at the polls with, with some of these, you know, uh, wild uh, conspiracy theorists on the right running them being involved? Yeah, in them? I, that's exactly. Uh, uh, well, that's a huge concern, right? What Doug Mastriano in uh, Pennsylvania says, I, I will decertify all the voting machines at the stroke of the pen. No discussion as to what's up with the voting machines, just a I will decertify them with the stroke of the pen. As you know, in Arizona, they've been playing this game for a long time. They do it in Michigan. They do it in Wisconsin. It, it is worrisome because a, a number of people now in America doubt the legitimacy of elections for no good reason, by the way. There's no reason to do so in the first place, but they do. And then you put people in place who are able to sow that doubt further. At, w- at, th- at that point, you start to wonder, are elections safe in this country? The fact is they are safe in this country. But as long as people don't believe they are, you have two problems. One is people withhold themselves from voting, uh, which is a bad idea. And number two is everybody decides that they throw the whole thing in doubt. I'm trying to think of who it was. Uh, there was a candidate. Oh, Herschel Walker in, in Georgia. It's hard to keep track of all the stuff uh, Sheriff Walker says. Um, <laughs> but he uh, he said he may not concede his election if he loses it. A lot of people just say that now. Yeah. They just say, I, I, if, I, if I win, I have won. If I have lost, it's unclear whether I've lost. That stuff is an erosion. Tim Snyder talks about that a lot, yeah. the, the Yale expert yeah. uh, on this stuff. That's the erosion of democracy itself, right? We are simply undermining. Donald Trump was doing this long before the election. He was out there saying, oh, it's mail-in ballots. It's all going to be fraud. A certain percentage of people believe him. Uh, Got to ask you, you did this great coverage and and dive into the fifth anniversary of of me too on your show you had toronto burke on and i'm sure others as well great, yeah. you also had a couple of great twitter threads and i'll tie it in with what's happening in, in iran you've always been 
a great guy and a champion for gender equity and against misogyny. And, and, and you've made, you know, us and, and the public so much more aware of it. I also know that you've created a lot of opportunities and sanctuaries for women to to uh, take advantage of and to come to you if, if need be, because you're just a, a great guy. You care about this stuff. I don't know, you know. Who made you this guy? Who made you this guy? Was it your mom? Is it? Uh, did you have yeah. a, an experience? I'm like you. I come from a, a very uh, a strong women influence background. Yeah, uh, the strong women in my family, the strong people in my family were women. So I, I, I have great women role models about me. Most of my bosses are women. Um, so I learned things that I didn't know as a guy. Um, yeah. You know, I just didn't know about why certain things are are more important. And 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 I think that what me too. And Tarana and people like that taught me was that thinking that you're on the right side of these things that like you and I did uh, well before me, too, is a little bit like Donald Trump thinking that he declassified documents. <laughs> right. It doesn't matter that you yeah. think you're on the right, wrong side. Right. It's on the right side of it. It matters that you recognize exactly the way in which you are part of the structure sure. that prevents women from achieving their fullest potential in little ways and big. And I'm a hundred percent part of that structure, a hundred percent part of a structure that that advantages me and disadvantages women. So then you have to go. And Tarana Burke and I had this conversation. You have to go and actively dismantle those structures, and it will cost you to do so. Yeah, it will cost it me can. some privilege to do so. But a, I got to know what privilege is. B, I got to know that I have it. And C, I got to decide that the world's going to be a better place if I don't possess more than my share of it. Right? If it's if it's distributed equally. But it's a, it's conceptual, right? You've got to decide. Toronto makes the point all the time. Me Too was not about sex. Me Too was about power. Right. Right. And when you realize that whether or not you ever exercise that power in an untoward way over a woman, the fact that you have it you means you have to actively work to relinquish it. And that's the that's the intrigue. Five years later, I want to know if enough enough guys, enough of those of, those of us in society have done that thinking and said, Ah, this is an instance of my power. This is an instance of my power. How do I actually make the world a better place as a result? I'm not sure if I agree with you that it'll cost you. Oh, well, well you'll get a better society. You'll, no, you'll, you'll have I, a better no, society as a result. You'll gain from that. It, it, it costs you if you believe that that privilege is of value to you, right? That that my ability to earn more than a woman, to have opportunities that are better than a woman, to get exposed to things uh, better than a woman may feel very good to me, even without knowing that, uh, that it's costing some woman uh, or, or women their their privilege. But I agree with you, Pete. Once you think about it properly, it didn't cost you. It doesn't well, cost I mean, you I just, a better society. The, the, what I heard was, I mean, I think... I think that one thing I've always tried to do is to create opportunities and open doors for people who aren't, just, you know, similar too similar to me um, and, and their background, uh, straightish, white, bald. But I think that it's also been I don't I don't do I, I like to think they're they're altruistic gestures or, or opportunities that I might create for someone. But I just have I'm just have a great example right now in that I did everything I could to help make Laura Coates a big name, a big star, give her opportunities and now she's a massive star and I'm out here in my shed and I'm not unhappy at all. But yesterday she texts me and she's like, hey, listen, come down to D.C. and do CNN. The point being, like, it, it not only did it not cost me the idea yeah. that you advocate for other people. I mean, it, it's going to come yeah. back to you or more, more, yeah. probably or more they'll, importantly, they'll pay it forward. it'll come back to my daughters. Like, like my Correct. daughters will be That's able to go right. to Laura's newsroom or right. or or. You know, any number of other people, young interns or something like I yeah. feel like when you when you're a good person, when you create yeah. opportunity, when you when you com, uh, share the privilege that you have, it, it arguably could be in your own self-interest. Yeah, it's good. It's a good feeling. Right. It's a good feeling to, to be that person who's who, unlike Donald Trump, who imagined it, you're <laughs> actually in it. Yeah. Right. You're actually saying I, I've identified a problem. I've identified my role. You know, it comes down to with me, too. You must have heard these con conversations after me, too, with a lot of guys who said, I'm not to blame for this. I never sexually harassed anyone. Yeah. I never sexually assaulted everyone. Anyone. Well, it's, like, it's not about blame. It's about responsibility. Yeah. You have ownership. You have power. You yeah. have the responsibility to change something. Forget the get the blame out of the conversation. Very small percentage of people were actually to blame yeah. for the things that that resulted in the hashtag me, too. But many of us were responsible because we own the power and had the ability to change yep. it. And yep. so the message should have been, ah, I have power. I can change this. Let's not get into any conversations about blame or the fact that I didn't have that. It's the same thing that happens with with Black Lives Matter. People say this is not me. I never did anything to, to them. It's like right. that's not the point. You have power. 
Use your power, whether it's political power, whether it's power at work, whether it's the vote, whether it's your tax, whether it's your money, your ability to take take your body out there and protest. Use your power to change society for the good, because if one of us is in chains, none of us are free. That's the way yeah. you have to look at me, too. It's the way you have to look at Black Lives Matter. It's the have to have the way you have to look at trans rights, everything. If, 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 if we do not. If, if everybody doesn't enjoy democracy and freedom and liberty and equity the way you and I do, Pete, then we're not in a country that does that right. And I'm OK with that. We're trying to get better. Right. We a more perfect union. We're going to try and continue to get better. That is the history of this country. Be part of the effort to try and make things better. And that's why I wanted to revisit five years after me, too, to say, has enough changed? The answer is absolutely not. But some of us are smarter for it. Yeah, that's for sure. We've we definitely all learned a lot. Let me uh, ask you about another women's rights issue, uh, which is you've been covering for years uh, what's going on in Iran, Iran. And, you know, you like a lot of other experts seemingly are saying this time does look different, but hedging with I don't know if anything will change. And, and a, a great thread you have because you said they're so powerful. They're so powerful there. And they always put down these these revolutions. We both yeah. covered what happened there in 2009 with the Green Revolution. Yeah, it, looked, it looked close, right? The Green Revolution looked like it did, you it know, did. something good happened and it did. And and people know if they know just a little bit about Iran's history, they know before uh, the, the 1979 revolution, it was a, a, a really I don't know what where do you want to use, but more progressive place of, of cultural richness. And so what's happening there right now? Do you how closely do you follow it day to day? Because you definitely have had some yeah, great closely. coverage on your show. So it, the thing to remember about Iran is that every American remembers 1979, the Islamic Revolution. Of every a certain Iranian age, yeah. remembers two other dates. They re- remember 1983 when the Americans shot down an Iranian passenger plane. Yeah. And they remember 1953 when they had a democratically elected prime minister who had been arguing with the British to say, you are in here in our oil fields and we would like the same royalties that the Americans give the Saudis. And the Brits said, can't do that. We're, we've just finished with a war. It's very expensive. We need all our revenues. And so they elected this guy and he said, I'm going to nationalize the oil fields. And the Brits obviously didn't want that to happen. So they convinced the Americans and a young CIA agent named Kermit Roosevelt, who is exactly of the Roosevelt family. Roosevelt got a million dollars, spread it around Iran and had this guy overthrown. They put the Shah of Iran in the Shah's father. And every time an American would go to Iran, Iran was a vassal state of America at that point. They would go. They would go with the catalogs from Northrop Grumman and all these places. Iran would buy all of our armaments all the way through to 1979. That Shah died. His son took over. So the, 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 the Iranian Revolution meant the end of buying American weaponry. Also meant, it was, by the way, it was a much more secular revolution than it seemed to be. It was an Islamic revolution, but there were it, secular groups involved. There were Christians involved. There were Jews involved. There's still a lot of Jews in Iran. And it, that became this hardline government. And there was an opportunity in 2015 to change that, to make it a less hardline government with the Iran nuclear deal. And uh, by Trump pulling out of that, he empowered the hardliners in Iran. So now you've got a super hardline government in Iran that uh, isn't as keen on getting back into the nuclear deal. Joe Biden's really trying to do it. And in that context, you've got hyperinflation and oppression. And then you've got this movement that started about a hijab and a woman dying. But now it's about everything. Now it's about people who are just They're done. They're done with this government. They're done with the hyperinflation. They're done with unemployment. They're done with the lack of opportunity. They're done with the lack of equity. And and I got to say, I'm seeing things happening in Iran that I've never seen before. Mm -hmm. Young girls taking off their headdresses and and, and shouting and and, and having their fists in the air. There's more than two, two hundred and fifty people who've been killed so far, according to reports. So and the the you know, the Revolutionary Guard and the Iranian government is very, very, very strong. So I don't want to give people false hope about what's going on. But something's happening here that is very, very different than I've seen. Police stations being set on fire. You can't. It's a police state. Iran is a police state. You can't. I mean, when I was there, I you can't drive a mile without getting stopped by some other level or you mean in of- general, in general. Yeah. Iran's a police state. They they understand that people in North Tehran who are more liberal uh, have alcohol in their houses. The ba- the rule is don't let anybody ever see that. They know that the, the headdress is worn very loosely amongst women in places like Tehran. There's sort of a, a detente. There's an understanding between Iranians. They say, all right, you government, you government guys are crazy, but just stay out of our lives. 
But then you have these morality police. They're scolds. They're old women in chadors who literally go around and 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 ch- scold people for the way they wear their headdress. And then they put them into these detention centers. And then this woman died. And at some point, it's like, OK, guys, I get it that you got some rules. It's fine. Lots of Muslim countries have hijab rules. How somebody end up dead? That's where you cross lines. And now it's a protest that's being led by women. I did a commentary that you were talking about, and I, I used the word Zan, Zindagi, and Azadi. Yeah, Zan means women. Zindagi means life. And uh, Azadi means liberty. That's the chant in the streets of Iran, which, by the way, could be chants in the streets of America, I frankly. Yeah. Um, but there's something there that's more interesting than it's been. Very hard to bet against the, uh, the Islamic uh, Republic of Iran because yeah. of all their power. But something's happening. Uh, two more quick things, uh, which I wanted to get your take on, uh, one of which, of course, is what's happening in Ukraine. You were there. You covered that for a, a really long time. But just quickly before that, you have been as bad, as good as anybody in media, certainly corporate media, at covering all kinds of different discrimination. But specifically, I wanted to talk about both the anti-Muslim hatred in this country, which you've always done a great job of. You know, you're, of course, a Muslim-born Canadian, uh, first generation, I think. Your parents uh, immigrated yep. to Canada from India, if yep. I have all that correct. But uh, I, from, from Well, we were in Kenya and they were in South Africa before that, but my ancestry is Indian. Uh, sorry, I, I skipped uh, most of your uh, life. But I got that wrong. But the more important, the, you have also just done, always been so great uh, when there are these spikes, these horrible violence that are uh, anti-Semitic, uh, specifically against Jewish people. And I, I know you talk with a lot, a lot of folks like Jonathan Greenblatt and others. How where were where are we now with Kanye's comments and Trump's specifically Trump's comments? But both of them Weird this stuff. past week, because my Jewish friends are really just like, we can't even believe this. We can't. I yeah. mean, we can. But what are your thoughts and just I, this most recent I'm where we're at? Back by, I'm not taking it back by much with Kanye anymore because um, yeah. because. I don't really like we've been following him for long enough to know I'm, I'm a little bit taken aback by Donald Trump stuff because it was such a weird um, rant about Jews in Israel really appreciate him. In fact, so much so that he could be the prime minister of Israel, which yeah. is just his narcissism. Um, but Jews in America had better watch out before it's too late. Get their or act together before it's too late or something act. like that. What the weird, fuck? weird, weird stuff. Uh, and I don't really understand it and I, I don't get it. But, I, you know, it all depends on what you think about what's going to happen with Donald Trump. I, Michael Cohen, whom I talked to last week because his new book is out, maintains Donald Trump's not running for president. There's too much grift in not being president. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if that's true. I actually think if, if you had to push me against the corner and say who might be the next uh, Republican presidential nominee, I'd say Donald Trump. And if you had pushed me back further into that corner and said who might win the next election, it could be Donald Trump. So I, I really worry about the, you know, I'm, you and I talk about sophisticated notions about people being more equal. And if one of us is in chains, all of us are, none of us are free. This isn't that. This is base level bigotry yeah. that we have coming from. And by the way, it started, Donald Trump did it with the Central Park Five. Yep. He did it the day he uh, announced his presidency, talking about Mexican rapists. He did it with the Muslim ban. Uh, he did it with stand back and stand by for the uh, the Proud Boys and Oath Keepers. Um, he did it with good people on both sides. So I, I, this is what he is. And at some point, Americans have got to say, this is not who we are, because it's not who we are, Pete. It's not who we are. Well, we are about, not a racist, 30, anti-Semitic, uh, homophobic. A lot of us are. Uh, we, but most of us are not. And most of us don't want to be. And I think that this is this is where it, when you will remember when Joe Biden launched his presidency, he did it with the pictures of Charlottesville and, and he called it the soul of the nation. This is a fight for the yeah. soul of the nation. But the thing we have to understand is it's not an abstract fight for the fall, for soul of the nation. It's all of our fight for the soul of the nation. We've all got to decide that this is horrible stuff and it has to be called out uh, at every level. The fact that the, the, the most prominent Republican in the country um, makes clearly anti-Semitic statements is mind boggling to me in 2022. Finally, on Ukraine, I wonder uh, your thoughts on the tide of the war, which you were there, you were covering. So many experts are surprised by how it has gone. And, but now the analysis is that uh, Putin's back is up against the wall. He's having a hard time getting recruits. He's recruiting murderers and rapists and sending them to the front. Uh, you've covered all of this. What about the debate over kind of a classic debate, but the debate over the West's support of the war uh, through 
weapons aid and everything else that we're doing and that we're prolonging this war and putting Putin in a corner. We need to give him off ramps. He's going to launch a nuke and it's going to be our fault. It's interesting, like especially, you know, the kind of the traditional pacifist, anti-interventionist uh, left. Uh, and then you got BS the- is what it is. Go ahead. It's BS. And I'm willing to call it out for it. You know what? I'm going to get a whole lot of tweets. And so are you about it. I get it on my show. When I was in Ukraine, Ukraine, I said that this is nonsensical. Uh, and I and I got it. It's, it's BS. Number one, the Finnish prime minister made it clear that, uh, uh, after the nuclear comments, Biden made a speech in which he said it was a fundraiser, I think, in New York, in which he said, I'm trying to figure out what the off ramp is. And the Finnish prime minister said the off ramp for Vladimir Putin is to get out of Ukraine. Um, and that remains a fact. Number two, this war is essentially a proxy war, right? It's a yeah. it's a NATO war without it being a NATO war. Yeah. Um, it, the, the you can't even if NATO provided all the weaponry and armaments that it did without the Ukrainian troops and, and civil defense who are remarkably spirited. You can't win that war because the Russians are conscripts, criminals, all these people, people getting taken off the street, given uh, AK-47s that are 50 years old that have been kept in warehouses that are rusty and not working. And they don't want to be involved in that war. Right. They don't even know what they're fighting for right. because there's no, no clear uh, messaging about that in Russia. I would have thought every day that this war goes on is advantage Russia. Very strangely, it doesn't seem to be the case. I'm, it, it's very strange that the Ukrainians may be winning this war. Again, they're winning this war entirely with Western support. They didn't have the ability to do so, but you can't put good weapons into the hands of people who can't fight or will not fight. Uh, and the Ukrainians, some brand new polling that came on out the other day, it's very hard to poll Ukrainians in this mess because so many people are gone and so many people are displaced. But there's an increase in the number of people who say this war ends when Russia leaves and Ukraine right. gets all of its territory back, including Crimea. Right. Ukraine wants Crimea back. Like they're saying this war ends when Russia's really out. The problem is we don't know what Vladimir Putin's mindset is. Does he think he loses? And if he loses, is that really bad? So should he throw in a tactical nuclear weapon? Now, remember, if he does, Russia's not it's not. It's not Hiroshima, right? They, they have tactical nuclear yeah, weapons right. that they can target into a non-populated area to basically demonstrate what they can do. Doesn't necessarily get us into a nuclear war. The United States is then not going to drop a nuclear bomb on Moscow. In fact, it might, it'll use conventional weaponry and it probably won't even go into Russia. Right? You've got the entire Black Sea fleet that's floating around the Black Sea, not territorial Russia. I, you can take the Black Sea fleet out. You can show Russia in 72 hours what getting into a war with NATO means. So I'm not I I think people have got to stop with the pacifist BS. It is this is a real war. It's an invasion of an independent country by an expansionist country that has unreasonable uh, views about how things go. If we can't protect the world from that, then then why have any world organizations? Why have a U.N.? Why have NATO? I I, I think we've got to we've got to take a strong view on this because Iran, who knows what they do? I'm not that worried about Iran. North Korea, China's going to surround Taiwan one of these days. If the world doesn't recognize that this stuff has to stop, then let's just dismantle the U.N. and go home. Ali Velshi, what a pleasure to uh, to talk to you. I love hearing your take on all this. Keep up the great work, man. Did you want to weigh in on Tom Brady and Giselle Bunchen's marriage? No, but thanks uh, for asking. Did you want to uh, talk about uh, any other frivolous? I can't even think of another one. I'm, I'm, I'm so caught <laughs> up with everything one, that we've been talking about. If there's uh, something I'm missing. I'll leave that all to you. Are you been? Do you watch any TV? Do you ever have time to watch a TV show? I'm I'm years behind on on stuff that I watch. You're watching Night Rider se- final yeah, season. Yeah, right. I'm I'm years behind. I, I watch nothing current at all. <laughs> One day, Monday, no recommendations for it. You're, you're going to be like, yes, Murder She Wrote. Call me some Sunday afternoon. You and I'll go to a movie together. Thank you very much for joining me, pal. Always awesome. Right, buddy. Yeah, Ellie Velshi, everybody. How about it? I'm going to a movie with him. I'm going to call him on a Sunday afternoon and go to a movie with him. Now, I wouldn't take up that kind of time. I mean, how does he have any time? The guy's always working. Always working. If he's not on TV, he's standing in the middle of a hurricane, for goodness sake. That was awesome. I hope you enjoyed it. I learned a lot. I love talking to him. Watch his show on Saturdays and Sundays. Follow him on Twitter. Tell him you just saw him. Heard him, rather, here on the show. And uh, on Twitter, please, before Twitter. Twitter's about to die, right? I'm being told. Oh, it'll be so sad. I love Twitter. I really do. But... When Elon Musk gets his grubby hands on it, we'll see. That's all I've got for you today and this week. Thank you so much for tuning in and pressing play on the podcast and subscribing and supporting the show with a paid subscription. If you aren't, 
I'd love to have you. We'd love to have you. So go now to standupwithp.com. I hope you have an awesome weekend if you're listening on a Friday. And I look forward to talking to you on Monday or anytime in between anywhere else. Mom and dad are coming down this weekend. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Also, uh, if you're still listening, I'll be on the uh, News Nation Friday tonight, Friday night, 10 o'clock if you want to tune into that. But have a great weekend, everybody. And thank you again. I love you guys. You're the best. Talk to you tomorrow. John Carroll next week. John Carroll, take us out, brother. 